Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 50, yep, five zero, who thought we'd make 50 of these things? Um, very fittingly, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite power tubes, the vintage Mullard EL34 XF2 series on my power tube matcher, and we're going to do it live so you can actually see um, how power tubes are matched. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, a while ago I showed you my custom power tube matcher. Based upon the schematic by Robert Hull, who is always extremely generous with his expertise and time. Thanks, Robert. And yesterday I was getting ready to test a bunch of vintage Mullard EO34 XF2s. And I realized you'd never seen my power tube tester working in real time. So, we're going to try and fix that today. Now I say try because it's hard filming with high voltage equipment making electrical noise as well as physical noise. Let's fire up the beast. That's my big flute power supply. It's a 500 um, 750 volt um, power supply. It's even got a separate supply for a negative bias and of course it can handle uh, 6 and 12 volt filament supply as well. So it's an all tube. I can't show it on camera. It's a beast and I'm not going to be I, I'm not fancy enough to have a couple of camera angles <laughs> or a drone up in the ceiling taking a shot. <laughs> that would be fun though. <laughs> Anyways, uh, how fitting to have uh, my tube lab powered up by, yep, a regulated tube power supply. Anyways, um, I've got some solid state ones as well, but I really like the fluke. It's It was designed for, for tube uh, for a tube lab, so it works perfectly. Okay, now let's get the high voltage meter on and let's take a look at what they are. So over here on your right we've got the grid bias voltage which is minus DC and in the case of the L34 we set the bias point at minus 36. We could set it at a different point and that would set a different operating point for the tube. Over here you're not seeing a number because the high voltage supply has an on off switch which is fabulous for testing. You don't want to be plugging in a tube with the high voltage on or, or going anywhere near it and pulling the, the live pins out. So let's bring it up. So we tested it at 400 volts. We're at 402 volts DC so that's what 0.5% off, so <laughs> that's pretty close. <laughs> I can actually trim the power supply, but that's about as close as we need to get. Over here we've got the uh, filament voltage in AC. It could be in DC for um, most tubes, and it's very close at 6.27. Now, I have a bunch of supplies that could, could run the filament, but I just like using this unregulated mil-spec um, filament supply. And I just throw it on my Variac, so I can dial it in. 6.2829, that's, that's more than close enough. Over here, this is our reading meter. Now, I don't, I don't want to go into too much in the way of details, because I, I've got a whole video on how this thing works, and, and I walk through the schematic. But basically, we've got a 1 ohm resistor in series with the cathode, and when uh, using Ohm's law, we have we have voltage over resistance equals current, right? So if we measure um, across the resistor one millivolt, that will equal one milliamp. Yeah, simple, easy peasy. Okay, Ohm's law is your friend if you do any design work with electricity. Okay. So, we've got our first two EL34s plugged in, we're warmed up, our hard voltage is stable. Now, that's one thing I wanted to mention. One of the critical things about 
uh, power tube testing is you want stable voltages. So now normally I don't have my meters arrayed like this. This is just so that you can see it. In fact, I actually have a meter on the fluke on the high voltage power supply. So I normally don't even have a meter um, sitting on the desk. So I normally have these three. So because I've got three independent power supplies, I essentially can dial in almost any tube from 0 to 750 volts on the plate and from 0 to, I think, minus 80 volts uh, on the grid bias. So I can set the operating point for almost every common tube and with some finagling, 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 whatever, <laughs> with some fooling around, with some careful fooling around, I can, I can get uh, my equipment probably up to about a thousand volts or a kilovolt. But anyways, that's for, that's another, that'll be another tube lab someday when we finally get around to testing the 211. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyways, if you don't know what the 211 is, look up a picture on Google and you say, oh yeah, I want to watch that. I want to watch that tube lab, Jim. I want to see that that puppy fired up. Well, I do too, but things are so damn busy, it could be a while. I say I'm going to do it on a rainy day, but it is raining out, and I'm busy filming this one. So, anyways. Okay, so, without further ado, let's test the first two. Now, I call this a power tube matcher, but, and I've got a pair of EO34s in, but I'm not necessarily matching these two to each other on the tester. What I'm doing is I'm finding out what their idle emissions are, right? So the, to test a power tube, it's strapped in triode mode, it's running in class A, and as a result, when we, when we connect up our tube to the circuit, we'll get a reading on the emissions. So we're getting a nice steady 19.4, 19.3 over here, and over on this side we're getting a very low 10 and a bit. Okay, let's let's turn off the high voltage. Let's pull out the tubes and see what we've got. We've got 20 milliamps was the uh, previous tested number and 9 milliamps was the previous tested number. So we're very close. And let's throw on a couple more. There's a nice metal based one. Now watch the filament voltage. First the power supply gets loaded down and the voltage drops, and then as the filaments heat up and get more stable, they'll come up to about 6.3, and we're really quite close now. As soon as the voltage stabilizes on the filament, the tube is uh, pretty much warmed up, or just about. And now we can turn the high voltage on, watch the plate voltage come up, here we go, we're at 401 volts DC. Our bias voltage is almost exactly minus 36 volts. We want our filament voltage to be almost exactly 6.3. Believe it or not, filament voltage makes a big difference as to how tubes, how much tubes emit. Small signal tubes, big tubes, they're all the same. You want a nice, um, fairly close, stable voltage, especially for testing. Okay. So let's test this first tube over here on your right. We're getting 27.5 millivolts or milliamps, same thing, right? And we're getting 20 and a bit on this side. Let's turn off the high voltage. And there we go, we've got good close testing numbers. Okay, so the critical things with um, with a power tube tester are stable voltages. In my case, I have an infinite range. Um, 
So stable power supplies are critical, and my big old fluke um, high voltage supply is the anchor of the whole system. This is just circuitry here. There's a couple of resistors, but basically this is wiring, a switch, some sockets. Um, there is a, the bias supply is actually underneath here. I can't flip it over easily. Um, let's get the high voltage supply off. There we go. <laughs> In fact, let's get all of the all the supplies off because they're going to almost certainly bring a little bit of a buzz. Okay, so that's the basics of a, a, a power tube matcher working. Now, when you measure the, um, when you set the, the plate voltage and the grid bias at a, um, at a, a close to normal um, amp operating point for your power tube, you're basically testing it in a real world condition. The biggest problem with the vast majority of power tube testers, particularly older ones, is that they'll test around 220 volts. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a circuit that runs the EL34 at 220 volts. And in fact, I got into an argument with a, with a supplier who sent me three really nice mullards and one low testing mullard. And he said, oh, he said, um, uh, different testers will get different results. Well, that's absolutely true. They do. And I was testing at real world voltages and he was testing at almost half my voltage. So which tester was giving the right results? <laughs> and it wasn't his. <laughs> so anyways, I lost that argument. Um, sometimes you do. And I didn't get compensated. So I'll basically I paid for four tubes, four expensive tubes, and I got three. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't a good day. But often good tube sellers, um, wholesalers who do this for a living or a part-time living will uh, realize the mistake they made and immediately um, compensate for the loss. So it's not, a, not everyone's a bad apple. Okay, so these voltage all these these voltages are distracting as all heck. So let's just turn them off. There we go. Now now I can think. So many of you know that I was on a family vacation last week. I managed to visit three children, two grandchildren, including a, a brand new one, <laughs> which was a great joy. Uh, all of the grandchildren are great joys in my life. Uh, one son-in-law and his mother, and uh, but who's counting? And I still managed to spend some quality time with my son, who's becoming much more involved in the business, and brought home some of the premium tubes he's found. Let's have a quick look at them. Now, if you've been watching me, you know one of my favorite tubes is the Philips E80CC. It's a almost substitute for the 12AU7. In reality, it is essentially a, it's a, it's, its own tube design, but it, in reality, it's a basically a higher spec, higher performing, better sounding tube than the 12AU7, which is why I'm into it. I'm always into tubes that sound great, but I've never, even though I've handled a lot of them, I've never had new old stock new in the box. Can you imagine? So this was a huge treat. Charles found them, so big shout out to Charles. My son is a great um, tube. I'm gonna. I think I nicknamed him the Tube Hound. <laughs> so, in North America, the E80CC was called the 6085. Let's see if we can get that box open without making a mess of it. Somewhere around here, I've got something that'll help us. I usually use the back of a, a thin blade, but my little poker will work just fine. Now, these boxes have the most amazing um, suspension. Take a look at this. The tube is just wedged right across the diagonal. It's the neatest thing. And look at that. It's just, it's just hanging there. All it is is just this fold over that big tip where the tube is molded. That's the final point before uh, this is the vacuum point. 
and uh, it's it's the final point that's closed off when the tube is vacated and the vacuum is created. But look at that, it just comes right out. Let's look at this. This is actually, I believe, a fairly early um, E80CC. I didn't check the date codes. They're on here. Um, but look at that, Phillips Mini Watt, 6085, SQ, that's with two stars, of course. <laughs> SQ is for special quality, and they write it right down here. Gold pins, a very nice uh, example of the tube, and believe it or not, I've got a match pair um, of, of new old stock, NOS, new in the box, NIB. Um, okay, moving on. You notice I'm trying to be careful. Of all the uh, tubes that I break, I break the E80CC the most. I Don't ask me how come. It's most small signal tubes you can drop them and they survive, but I break the little pips, the tips off. Uh, I drop them on something soft and they still are damaged and don't work properly. Uh, once I dropped a whole bag of them. I don't know how it, you know, call me Butterfingers. And talking about Butterfingers, take a look at this. Now, I don't know if you, anybody knows, but I'm also the budget audiophile. That's right. I've never, I've never been rich, and um, I've always been very careful with what I spend on audio. If I want to stay happily married, I do. <laughs> and many of you are in the same boat, I'm sure. So one of my favorite phono cartridges of all time is the uh, Japanese-made Nagaoka. Now, hopefully I pronounced that well. And that's the uh, 110 model. This is actually the serial for a stylus. Now, um, Butterfingers here. Normally, my favorite way to break a stylus is to stick a thumb right on the tip, jam the tip or the stylus. And of course, I bend, I bend the, um, the shank of the stylus. It doesn't take much to damage a stylus. The tube is very, very delicate. Anyways, the other day, I had a whole bunch of stuff going on around the stereo system, and I managed to flip my finger on the tone arm, flip it onto the mat, which is a nice, soft, um, anti-static mat, skid it all the way across the mat, and yes, you guessed it, I bent the stylus. It's a new trick. I've never done that one before. Anyways, um, the uh, Japanese supplier... Uh, sent me for a very reasonable money, amount of money a new replacement stylus. I have to buy one every six months. <laughs> Not because I wear them out. <laughs> you can guess why. But take a look at this. Now, I like to send a little personalized note with my shipments. It's just a way to touch base with the customer. It gives me a little bit of room for commenting on the order. Sometimes tubes are rebranded. Sometimes there's something a little strange about the tube that's not an issue, but I like to point it out before I get an email saying, hey, hey Jim, what's with, you know, what's with the, um, the shape of the getter? Or what's with the, this brand name on this tube? That's not a Sylvania. Well, actually it is. It's just got a rebrand, and that's a very common thing. So anyways, I put little notes in. But look what the seller of the replacement stylus did. He put a beautiful piece of origami and wrote a little note. Let's look at the let's look at the creature he made. Let's see if I can get it open. There we go. Isn't that lovely? And my wife, who loves to do origami, said that this is a lucky crane. Isn't that gorgeous? Anyways, a big thank you. And he included a lovely little note as well. And his writing is a lot better than mine, so I was really feeling um, like this guy has his act together, and I'm, I just, I've never had a good script. So I was uh, in school uh, when we were doing cursive writing. I'm sure that my teachers rolled their eyes and um, let out a big sigh that I would never improve. But anyways, um, it was just, just lovely. I love getting a little note with something like that. That was just. Just so, so kind. Okay, what else came in? Well, one of the things I, I muled back from my son's place, I brought back, what did I bring back? I brought at least 500 quality vintage tubes. 
Um, and they went on a hell of a journey. They got lost once. <laughs> but the airline showed up the next day with them, thank goodness, because the the compensation I would have seeked would have been enormous. So they didn't know that, of course. You don't declare the value when you check in. He, I moved that case on three airplanes and um, two cases, actually. Excellent cases, heavy-duty shipping cases that my son had. And we had them marked fragile, and they had to be checked in, um, especially because they're fragile. But the airlines handled them, and we broke one tube out of about 500 plus tubes. So, and luckily it wasn't a very expensive tube. So that, that was a good experience, I think. So, uh, one of the things he he scored or found, I shouldn't say score because we paid a lot of money for them, is he had found a whole bunch of Muller DO 34s. That's uh, sort of the theme of of our 50th episode. So we have, for the first time ever, I have finally matched um, up a quad of double O getters. Let me see if I can get them up on camera for you so you can see. Now, most Muller XF2 series had single getters on a double support. And um, this is these were made in the same years. Um, they're the same series. As far as I can tell, there's virtually no difference other than the getter. The gettering is about the same. So it's a complete mystery to me. Online, there's very little about these. Some people have, have said that they're made in specific years, but I've been documenting the years, the, the day codes that are on these things. And I've got day codes ranging from 1960 to 1970. So... And that's the same for the single getters. So I have no idea what's going on with that. If somebody knows, jump into the comments section and um, inform us all. So we've got we've got some double O getters in the store. What else came in? And for I think only the second time, I actually have some quads, some new old stock, new in the box, XF2 quads. Now look at this. Every Every tube is in a different box. There's a Sylvania, that's a rebrand, of course. Phillips is not really a rebrand. Phillips owned Mullard, but it's got the Phillips name on it. Another mini watt. RCA. Uh, RCA uh, rebranded a lot of uh, Mullard EO34s. And another Phillips box, a different box. And this one is uh, the Rogers version. Uh, Rogers was uh, a tube company, a quality tube company based in Toronto, and um, they started off as an independent company, but they had they had ties to Sylvania, and um, fairly early on, Phillips bought them out, and Phillips also eventually bought out Sylvania as well. So, and in a future tube, I will talk talk a little bit more about that because there's another tube um, that's all tied into this, the 6SN7. Rogers, Sylvania. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes. Let me go grab them. They're hiding under here. There we go. And remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world at $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.